everyone. My name is Ageliki or Angeliki, if you prefer the English version, first much of you. And I am a PhD student in classics. I'm uh, very happy that we are all here for the Iliad reading, which is um, a part of the European Latin and uh, Greek uh, festival. So um, what makes this reading special is that it is uh, international. What does this mean? It actually means that uh, nearly 6,000 uh, people are reading the Iliad today on five continents. And because there can be no performance without audience, I would like to thank you all most warmly for being here with us today. So, the Iliad is the oldest uh, extant uh, poem work of uh, Greek literature and one of the oldest work of Western literature. It consists of almost 16,000 uh, lines and it uh, into 24 books. So that's the Iliad, so all of it here. Um, yeah, so today we're gonna read uh, book one in nine different languages. But before we do that, we will first have the honor to listen to one of Scotland's most celebrated poets, Professor Robert Crawford. Professor Crawford will introduce our reading, share his thoughts on the role of poetry in our lives. So how does poetry help us to exchange and develop ideas? How do ideas travel in time through poetry? What urges humans to write and read poetry? Professor Robert Crawford studied and taught English literature at Glasgow and Oxford, and since 1989, he has been working at the University of uh, St. Andrews. He has published over 35 books and seven collections of uh, poetry. Among his uh, latest uh, uh, publications is a testament published in uh, 2014, a collection of uh, poems, Young Eliot, which is the first volume of his uh, two-volume biography of T.S. Eliot, and The Scottish Ambassador, which is this book here, published in 2018, last August, I think. Um, yeah, and this is a collection of uh, poems as uh, well. Um, so let us uh, welcome Professor uh, Crawford with a warm applause. Classicists. It's absolutely wonderful to be here and, and to be part of this event. Um, I say I'm long lapsed, so the Iliad is rarely on my desk, and yet somehow it's always under my feet. It's part of the ground on which we move. The Iliad and the Odyssey remain among the foremost foundational texts of European literature. And as such, for most people, they are, like all foundations, far below the surface, trodden under, often ignored, yet implicitly relied on, and still, however vaguely, part of everyday discourse. The Trojan horse of computer science depends on the Homeric world, yet not quite on the words of the Iliad itself. The same is true of the Achilles heel. Our civilization still gestures towards that Homeric world, but if the gestures are to be more than empty ones, we need from time to time to return to the source, reminding ourselves just what this great ground base, the Iliad, means. Listening not just to its after echoes, but to its particular poetic music. To what, there, to what is there, rather than what vaguely we associate with it. We need to go back like cleaners and keep the text spruced up, clear and dust free. We need to hear the Iliad afresh. To go to the Iliad is to return to a resonant point of origin and a disturbing one. 
If the Iliad, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, reminds us that poetry is such an abiding and intimate, as well as a public, art form, then it also carries with it over the millennia a voltage of disturbance. Recent examinations of appropriation of classical sources by resurgent right-wing extremists may be salutary. And no one can stand in Ian Hamilton Finlay's Little Sparta, just south of this Athens of the North, or can stand outside the imposing neoclassical glyptotech in Munich where books once were burned, or can stand outside the Rosa Parks Museum of Troy University, Alabama, on the site of the former Empire Theatre, where Mrs. Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on that Montgomery City bus, without reflecting on the relationship between violence, empire, and cultural power. Yet if the Iliad is undeniably a war poem, a poem of violence, when we listen to it again, it's also at some moments at least a poem of what seems pre-Virgilian tenderness and patient suffering. Nowhere more so than in books 6 and 24. It's those books more than any others which speak to me through contemporary poetry not least when, like deep foundations suddenly exposed, they fuse with modern material, yet remain unchanged in some of the most moving texts that I've encountered. On this day, when a professor from Lyon, Christophe Cusset, invites people around the world to spend an hour hearing the Iliad, Let's salute the old alliance, not just between Scotland and France, or between the Athens of the North and that of the South, but between poetry now and the foundational poetry of Homer. To take just one example, the contemporary French poet Michel de Guy, in his poem Passim, which I'll read soon in Clayton Eshelman's English translation, achieves pathos and disciplined power, not by rewriting the Homeric account of Hector's farewell to Androche and Astyanax, but by embedding a version of Homer's lines within his De Guise modern text. The huge number that represents the casualty figures of modern warfare is juxtaposed with a sense of grammatical conjugation and a hint of sunt lacrimae rerum. But the core of the poem, honest to a sense of distance in its translatories, as well as honest to its sense of herd closeness, is unmistakably a passage straight from the Iliad's mouth. Passion. And, and they die and you die, and we die, and she, he, it dies, and you again, and I die. Here often I am a little, like still a little, and I could cry at any moment. Was it 2,310,932, 724,000, 864, it seemed to me that suddenly I was about to cry. When will we have done with? Speaking thusly, he was stretching toward his son, magnificent Hector, but the child at the breast of the nurse with a beautiful sash drew back crying. His father's looks terrify him. He is afraid of bronze and the horsehair crest terrible at the top of the helmet, he sees it move. His father, his noble mother, burst out laughing. At once he took his helmet from his head, magnificent Hector, and he placed it on the ground, shining all over. Then his son, he kissed him and took him in his arms. He said, invoking Zeus and the other gods, Just a moment more, 
executioner. It will be over in an instant. Just a moment more, executioner, because it shines the scene, because it goes to the eyes of the day moved to tears to tears in the eyes that are going to leave all that, that were not even aware of it before. All that one will have to take away, the offer holds what we were deprived of. A God gathers the world to his arms that he did not know he must go back as if there were nothing to it. This great poem of Michel de Guise alone signals why we are called back rightly to revoice the Iliad, to speak it back because it speaks to and through us still and not just because we're in the Athens of the North, or because we're French or European, but because, like the father, the mother, and the child at that parting scene in Iliad 6, we are simply and complicatedly human. Thank you very much for this. I really, at the moment, I think I cannot find the words to express how I feel. I don't know. It really touched me. So thank you very much for, for that. Yeah. So um, maybe with these thoughts in mind and our feelings, I don't know. Each of us have different thoughts, different feelings. But yeah, we can keep that in mind and um, uh, discover the Iliad or maybe even create our own, our own version of the Iliad through our multilingual lingual reading. Therefore, I would like to welcome uh, our speakers, uh, so namely Laura Donati, who will read the ancient Greek text in the hexameter, uh, Mark Huggins, who will read the Iliad in uh, English, Antonio Jacobiello, who will read in Italian, Manos Tsakiris, who will read in modern Greek, uh, Celeste Blois, who will read in uh, French, Gladys Maslum, who will read in uh, uh, Spanish. Ines Adam, sorry, Adam Dahmer, who will read in uh, Scottish Gaelic. And Ines uh, Silva, who will read in uh, Portuguese. I will read in uh, German. <laughs> Menina ei de tea, peleia de o Achilleos, ulo menene muri, acaio salge teke. Follas dictimus, psucassa il dipro iapsen, eruon autus de loria teo que cunessi. Oio noi si te passi, dios de teleie tubule, ex sudeta prota, dias te tene risante. Altre ideste anax, andron cae dios Achilleus. Tistas poete on, eridixione eke macestai. Letus cae diosuios, eh, diosuios o garbas ilei coloteis. Nusona nastra tonorse, cacono le conto de lagoi. Une caton crusen, et imase nare terra. A treides o garelte, toasse pinea sacaion. Luso menonte tiugatra, feronta peresia poina. Stemma te conen kersin e che volua collonos. Crusa nasce tro, caisse to panta sacaius. Atre ida de malis, ta duocos metore laon. Atre ida e te caiallo e u knemide sacaiui. Umi in mentio idoie no vumpia doma te contes. Ec per sai pi amoio, polim e u doica di kestai. Paida de moe lusaite, pilenta da tada poina de kestai. Azzo menoi di osuglio e che volona pollona. Enta alloi men pante se peo femesa na caiui. Ai de stai tierea, caiagla decta la poina. Allo catride, agamemno nienda ne ciumo. Alla cacosa piei, crateron de pimutonetelle. 
me seguirò in coilesi e go per a neusichicheio. E non de tu non e iustero nauti si onta. Me lo toiu crasimen che tronca il stemma te oio. Ten de gui bluso per min calgera se peison. E metterò in ioi coe narghe i telo di patres. Isto ne poi come nel caiemon caiemon le cosanti osan. Alliti me e ritizze sa oti lo sos che ne hai. O se fate dei sen, o viron caie peito to diuto. Veda che on paratina polufo sboio talasses, polla de peita paneute, chi on erato geraios. A polloniana, titoneu che moste che leto. Cluti meo arguru tox, o scluse nanfi bebecas. Chi l'anteza te è, te ne doio te i fianasseis. Smin teu e i potetoi, cariente pineo ne repsa. E e i de potetoi, catapio na meri e chea. Tauro ne dai gon, to de moi creeno ne eldor. Ti se i anda na oi, e ma da tua soi si belessi. O se fateo come nos, tu de que foi vos apollo. Be de cadoli un poio, care on che co o menosche. Tox o moi sine con, am fe refia te faretren. En claxan daroi, Stoie pe mon come noio. Auto chi ne tento so dei e nucti e oicos. Ed ze pei tapaneu, te ne on metadio ne eche. Dei ne dec langhe, che ne targu re oio bi oio. U re asmen pro, to ne pochi to calchi una sarbius. Auto re pei autoi si belos e pecheu che si fieis. Valle a iei de pirai, ne cuon ca ion tota meiei. Enne mar menana, stratonochi to chela te oio. Te de cate da goren, de calessa to laon Achilleus. Togare pifresi, te togare pifresi te che te alle ucole no serie. Che de to garda na on, o tirat ne sconta sorato. Oie penun e ger, te no me gere este genonto. Toi si danista menos, mette te poda so più sacileus. A tre i belli unamme, pali planchenta so io. Apsa po no ste sein, e i kenta na tolghi fi goimen. E i domi po le mos, te da macca il uomo sacaius. Alla gheda ti na man, ti ne reio menei i rea. E cai o nei ro polon, cai gatto na rec di osestin. Os os che il poio ti tosso ne cosa tu foi vos apollon. E i tarogheo coles, e pi mem se sta ie de catombes, ai che impossar non, che ni se sa i gonte te leion. Vi le taglianti a sas, e mi napo l'oio na mionei. E tu i gosse i pon, catarezze tu toi si daneste, calca stesto rides, o io napo lo no caristos. O se de ta te onta, ta adesso me napo te onta. Cai, cai ne, ne, Caine esse gasa a caion ilio neiso. Endi a mantu sunen, tenoi ore foi vos apollon. Es fine ufroneon agoresa tu caime te eipe. O achileo che le hai, medii file mute sastai. Men in apollo nos, e catebe le tau anactos. Toi garegone reo, su de sunte o caime lo mosson. Emen moi profron, e pesin cae kersin arexei. E garo io a Maiandra, colese menos megapanto. Arge io in catei, caio e peiton tagliacaioi. Cresso in gar basileu, o te cose tagliandri che rei. E per garte colon, ge gaiau, te mar cate pemsen. Alla te cai metupis, te ne cai cotonò fratelesse. Enz te tessi ne ois, e oisi, si ude frasai mesaose. Then in answer again spoke Achilleus of the swift feet, Speak, interpreting whatever you know, and fear nothing. In the name of Apollo, beloved of Zeus, to whom you, Calchas, make your prayers when you interpret the God's will to the Danaans, no man, as long as I am alive above earth and see daylight, shall lay the weight of his hands on you beside the hollow ships. 
not one of all the Danans, even if you mean Agamemnon, who now claims to be far the greatest of all the Achaeans. At this the blameless seer took courage again and spoke forth. No, it is not for the sake of some vow or hecatomb he blames us, but for the sake of his priest whom Agamemnon dishonored, and would not give him back his daughter, nor accept the ransom. Therefore the archer sent griefs against us, and will send them still, nor sooner thrust back the shameful plague from the Danaans, until we give the glancing-eyed girl back to her father, without price, without ransom, and lead also a blessed hecatomb to Chrissi, thus we might propitiate and persuade him. He spoke thus and sat down again, and among them stood up Atreus' son, the hero wide ruling Agamemnon, raging, the heart within filled black to the brim with anger from beneath, but his two eyes showed like fire in their blazing. First of all he eyed Kalchas bitterly and spoke to him, Seer of evil, never yet have you told me a good thing. Always the evil things are dear to your heart to prophesy, but nothing excellent have you said nor ever accomplished. Now once more you make divination to the Danans, argue forth your reason why he who strikes from afar afflicts them, because I for the sake of the girl Chryseis would not take the shining ransom, and indeed I wish greatly to have her in my own house, since I like her better than Clitemestra, my own wife, for in truth she is no way inferior, neither in build nor stature nor wit, not in accomplishment. Still, I am willing to give her back, if such is the best way. I myself desire that my people be safe, not perish. Find me then some prize that shall be my own, lest I only, among the Argives, go without, since that were unfitting. You are all witnesses to this thing, that my prize goes elsewhere. Then in answer again spoke brilliant, swift-footed Achilleos, son of Atreus, most lordly, greediest for gain of all men. How shall the great-hearted Achaeans give you a prize now? There is no great store of things lying about that I know of. But what we took from the cities by storm has been distributed. It is unbecoming for the people to call back things once given. No, for the present, give the girl back to the god. We Achaeans thrice and four times over will repay you. If ever Zeus gives into our hands the strong-walled citadel of Troy to be plundered. Then in answer again spoke powerful Agamemnon, Not that way, good fighter, though you be, godlike Achilleos, strive to cheat, for you will not deceive, you will not persuade me. What do you want, to keep your own prize and leave me, have me sit here, lacking one? Are you ordering me to give this girl back? Either the great-hearted Achaeans shall give me a new prize, chosen according to my desire to atone for the girl lost, or else, if they will not give me one, I myself shall take her, your own prize, or that of Aeus, or that of Odysseus. Going myself in person, and he whom I visit will be bitter. Still, these are things we shall deliberate again hereafter. Come, now we must haul a black ship down to the bright sea, and assemble rowers enough for it, and put on board it the hecatomb, and the girl herself, Chryseis of the fair cheeks, and let there be one responsible man in charge of her, either Aeus, or Idomeneus, or brilliant Odysseus, or you yourself, son of Peleus, most terrifying of all men, to reconcile by accomplishing sacrifice the archer. Then. Looking darkly at him, Achilleus of the swift feet spoke, O oh, wrapped in shamelessness with your mind forever on profit, how shall any one of the Achaeans readily obey you, either to go on a journey or to fight men strongly in battle? I, for my part, did not come here for the sake of the Trojan spearmen to fight against them, since to me they have done nothing. Never yet have they driven away my cattle or horses, Never in Thea, where the soil is rich and men grow great, did they spoil my harvest, since indeed there is much that lies between us, the shadowy mountains and the echoing sea. But for your sake, O oh great shamelessness, we followed to do you favor, you with the dog's eyes, 
to win your honor and Menelaus from the Trojans. You forget all this or else you care nothing. And now my prize you threaten in person to strip from me, for whom I labored much, the gift of the sons of the Achaeans. Never when the Achaeans sack some well-founded citadel of the Trojans do I have a prize that is equal to your prize. Always the greater part of the painful fighting is the work of my hands. But when the time comes to distribute the booty, yours is the far greater reward. And I, with some small thing yet dear to me, go back to my ships when I am weary with fighting. Now I am returning to Thea, since it is much better to go home again with my curved ships, and I am minded no longer to stay here dishonored and pile up your wealth and your luxury. Lo ricambiò allora il sire d'eroi Agamennone. Vattene se il cuore ti spinge. Io davvero non ti pregherò di restare con me. Con me ci sono altri che mi faranno onore. E soprattutto c'è il saggio Zeus. Ma tu sei il più odioso per me tra i re alunni di Zeus. Contesa sempre te cara. E guerre e battaglie. Se tu sei tanto forte, questo un dio te l'ha dato. Vattene a casa con le tue navi, coi tuoi compagni, regna sopra i mirmidoni. Di te non mi preoccupo, non ti temo adirato, anzi, questo dichiaro, poiché Criseide mi porta via Febo Apollo. Io, lei, con la mia nave e con i miei compagni, rimanderò, ma mi prendo Briseide, guancia graziosa, andando io stesso alla tenda, il tuo dono, sì, che tu sappia quanto son più forte di te, e tremi anche un altro di parlarmi alla pari o di levarmisi a fronte. Disse così, al pelide venne dolore, il suo cuore nel petto peloso fu incerto tra due, se, sfilando la daga acuta via dalla coscia, facesse alzare gli altri, ammazzasse la tride, o se calmasse l'ora e contenesse il cuore. E mentre questo agitava nell'anima in cuore, e sfilava da fodero la grande spada, venne Atena dal cielo. L'inviò la dea Era, braccio bianco, amando ugualmente di cuore ambedue e avendone cura. Li stette dietro, per la chioma bionda prese il pelide, a lui solo visibile. Degli altri nessuno la vide. Restò senza fiato Achille, si volse, conobbe subito palla di Atena. Terribilmente gli lampeggiarono gli occhi, e volgendosi a lei parlò parole fugaci. Perché sei venuta, figlia di Zeus e Gioco, forse a veder la violenza da Gamennone Atride? Ma io ti dichiaro, e so che questo avrà compimento. Per i suoi atti arroganti perderà presto la vita. E gli parlò la dea Atena a occhio azzurro. Io venni a calmar la tua ira, se tu mi obbedisci, dal cielo. Mi inviò la dea Era, braccio bianco, che entrambi ugualmente ama di cuore e cura. Su, smetti il litigio, non tirar con la mano la spada. Mi ingiuria con parole, dicendo come sarà. Così ti dico, infatti, e questo avrà compimento. Tre volte tanto splendidi doni a te soffriranno un giorno per questa violenza. Trattieniti dunque e obbedisci. E disse ricambiando l'Achille piede rapido, Bisogna una vostra parola, o Dea, rispettarla, anche chi molto è irato in cuore. Così è meglio, chi obbedisce agli dèi, molto essi l'ascoltano. Così sull'elsa d'argento trattenne la mano pesante, spinse indietro nel fodero la grande spada, non disobbedì alla parola d'Atena. Ella verso l'Olimpo se n'era andata, verso la casa di Zeus e Gioco, con gli altri nomi. Di nuovo allora il pelide con parole ingiuriose investì la tride e non trattenne il corruccio. Ubriacone, occhi di cane, cuore di cervo, mai vestir corazza con l'esercito in guerra, né andare all'agguato coi più forti degli Achei, osa il tuo cuore. Questo ti sembra morte. E certo è molto più facile nel largo campo degli Achei strappare i doni a chi a faccia a faccia ti parla, re mangiatore di popolo perché a buoni a niente comandi, se no davvero, Atride, ora per l'ultima volta offendevi, ma io ti dico e giuro gran giuramento, sì, per questo scettro, che mai più foglie o rami 
Matterà, poiché ha lasciato il tronco sui monti, mai fiorirà, che intorno ad esso il bronzo ha strappato foglie e corteccia. E ora i figli degli Achei, che fanno giustizia, lo portano in mano. Essi le leggi in nome di Zeus mantengono salde. Questo sarà il giuramento. Certo, un giorno rimpianto d'Achille prenderà i figli degli Achei, tutti quanti, e allora tu in nulla potrai, benché afflitto, aiutarli, quando molti per mano d'Ettore massacratore cadranno morenti, e tu dentro lacererai il cuore, rabbioso che non ripagassi il più forte degli Achei. Disse così il Pelide e scagliò in terra lo scettro, disseminato di chiodi d'oro. Poi egli sedette. Χώρια και ο γιο του Ατρέα ξεφρένιαζε. Πετάχτη τότε μπρο τον Έστορα, ο γλυκομίλητο αγορητή τη πύλο, που πιο γλυκά από το μέλι ανάβριζαν τα λόγια του από το στόμα. Δυο είχαν δει τα μάτια του γενιέ ω τώρα να πεθαίνουν, θνητών ανθρώπων που γεννήθηκαν και τράνεψαν πιο πρώτα, στην άγια πύλο και βασίλευε πια στη γενιά την τρίτη. Και τότε μίλησε καλόγνωμο ανάμεσό του και είπε: Όχου τρανό κακό που πλάκωσε τον αρχαιόν τη χώρα. Ο Πρίαμο πόσο θα αναγκάλιαζε και η γη του Πριάμου τώρα, πόσο βαθιά και οι Τρόε και οι Πίλητοι θα χαίρονταν αλήθεια, τούτα για εσά του δυο να μάθαιναν πω αρπαχτήκατε έτσι. Οι πρώτοι αργήτε και στη φρόνεψη και στο κοντάρι πρώτοι. Μα τώρα ακούστε μου. Τα χρόνια μου κανένα σα δεν τα έχει. Εγώ είχα σμίξει με άντρο κάποτε πολύ τρανούτερου σα, χρόνια παλιά, και αυτοί τα λόγια μου δεν τα ψεφούσαν, όχι. Άντρε παρόμοιου δεν αντάμωσα, και ουδέ και θα ανταμώσω. Σαν τον πυρίθο ή τον πολύφημο, που ίδια Θεό λογιόταν, σαν τον Εξάδιο, σαν τον Δρίαντα, σαν τον Κενέα το Ρίγα, σαν τον Θησέα στην όψη που μοιάζε Θεό, το γιο του Αιγαία. Πολλά αντριωμένοι εκείνοι στάθηκαν στι γη του άντρε μέσα, πολλά αντριωμένοι και επολέμησαν και με πολλά αντριωμένου, με του βουνού του δράκου τάβαλαν και του χαλάσαν όλου. Μα αυτού εγώ συναπαντήθηκα, φτασμένο από την πύλο. Πέρα από τόπο αργοτάξιδο, τι ατήτου με καλέσαν και χώρια και δικού μου μάχου μου. Από όσο στρέφει τώρα η γη, κανένα δεν θα έχει ανάγκαρα να χτυπηθεί μαζί του. Και ωστόσο παίρναν και τη γνώμη μου και μου άκουγαν το λόγο. Λοιπόν και εσεί ελάτε, ακούστε μου, χαρά σε αυτόν που ακούει. Και μη τεσί και έχει δύναμη την κόρη να του πάρει. Μου να αφήσει έτην, ώστου την έδωκα να αποξαρχεί η αργήτα. Μη τε και εσύ έχει λέει να ρίχνεσαι του βασιλιά μα τώρα, σαν ίσια και όμοιο. Τι δεν έλαχε την ίδια με του άλλου τιμή ένα ρίγα πρωτοστάτορα που οδεία στον μεγαλύνει. Κι αν είσαι δυνατό. Κι αν σε έκανε θεά μητέρα εσένα, στέκει απ' την άλλη αυτό πιο πάνω σου, τι πιο πολλού ορίζει. Η γέ του Ατρέα, και εσύ την όγιδα παράτα του Αχυλαία, μην του κρατά θυμό, ξορκίζωσε τη στου αρκείτε όλου, αυτό μα στέκει κάστρο απτράνταχτο με στη σφαγή την άγρια. Και ο πρωταφέντη αγαμέμνονα, γυρνώντα το αποκρίθη. Τα όσα μου λε αλήθεια γέροντα, πολύ σωστά και δίκαια. Μα αυτό εδώ γυρεύει από όλου μα να στέκεται πιο πάνω. Όλου δικού του να έχει, όλου μα να κάνει το κουμάντο. Όλου να ορίζει με τα λόγια του θα πάνε θαρό του ανέμου. Και αν η Θεή μα θέσει αθάνατη τον κάμαν ανδριωμένο, του δόκαν τάχα και το ελεύθερο να βγαίνει να μα βρίζει. Το λόγο του κόψε τρισέβγαινο τότε αχυλαία και του είπε: Αλήθεια να με πούνε θα άξιζε και ο τίκε τυποτένιο, σ' ό,τι και αν έλεγε σαν σύγκλημα, να κάνω ό,τι προστάζει. Άλλου αν θέλει βρει και αφέντευε, σε μένα πια μην κάνει κουμάντο τώρα. Τι τα λόγια σου θα πάνε θαρό του ανέμου. Κάποιο άλλο λόγο τώρα θα έλεγα. Και εσύ στον νου σου βάλτον. Στα χέρια αλήθεια εγώ δεν έρχομαι με σένα, για και μάλλον, για αυτή την κόρη που μου δώσατε και τώρα παίρνετε μου. Όμω απ' τα άλλα που μου βρίσκονται μέσα στο γοργό καράβι, δεν έχει να μου πάρει τίποτα χωρί το θέλημά μου. Η δε και αν θες ο μπρο δοκίμασε για να το δουν και τούτη, ευτή θα να βρισσίσει το αίμα σου τρογύρα από το κοντάρι. Έτσι ω πιαστήκαν συναλλάζοντα λόγια βαριά και δυο του, σκοθήκαν και σκολούν τη σύναξη στα αργήτικα καράβια. Και τράβηξε ο Χιλέα για τα άλμενα τα καλοζυγιασμένα και τα καλύβια με τον Πάτροχλο μαζί και του συντρόφου. Και ο γιο του Ατρέα, ο γοργό στη θάλασσα, καράβι λέει και ρίχνουν. Διαλέει και λαμνοκόπου είκοσι, πλήθεια σφαχτά φορτώνει για το Θεό, τη λοδομάγουλη μετά τη χρυσοπούλα καθίζει. Μπήκε και ο Πολύνομο να κυβερνά ο Δυσσέα. Μπήκαν λοιπόν και αυτοί και αρμένιζαν στη θάλασσα στι στράτε. Και ο γιο του Ατρέα το ασκέρι πρόσταξε να ξαγνιστεί και εκείνοι λούζονταν και όλα τα απονύματα με στο κελό τα ρίχναν. Και στον Απόλλων αψεγάδιαστα τα αυριά και εκεί διασφάζαν. Πολλά. Στι άκαρπε τη θάλασσα μπροστά του γερογιάλι. Η 
Et l'odeur de gras salé au ciel en valut au trop de la fumée. Ainsi, sacrifié à ses poissons, j'attendais l'armée. Mais également, ne mit pas un terme au conflit dont il avait des abords menacés à qu'il. Il s'adressait à Télépiphos et Eurybates, qui étaient ses héros et ses accueillis pleins de zèle. Rendez-vous au pavillon d'Aquille le Biliade. Prenez par la main Briseis au bel jour et amenez-la. Si ne vous la donne pas, j'irai la prendre moi-même avec un plus grand nombre de, de hommes. De quoi le faire plutôt prisonnier. À ces mois, il l'expédia usant de dames violents pour le donner ses ordres. Quant le gris, ils marcheront le long de la grève de la mer effécondée et parveniront au pavillon et au neuf de Mermadon. Ils trouveraient Aquilé près de son pavillon et de sa neuf noire. Il était assis, le vieux ne remplit pas Aquil de joie. Eux, puis de feuillet, intimidés devant le roi, s'arrêteraient sans élever la voix ni lui poser des questions. Mais dans son cœur, il comprit et le dit. « C'est l'hiver, messager de Zeus, messager des hommes aussi, approchez, vous ne m'avez rien fait vous, mais c'est agrément. Il vous expédie pour la fille pour Roséas. Allons, Patroc, reste Zeus, amenez la fille et donne-la l'heure pour qui l'amener. Et que soient mes témoins devant les deux behéreuses, devant les hommes mortels et devant ce roi qui m'est hostile, si jamais il ait encore besoin de moi pour écarter des autres l'indigné fio, ah, son âme maudit et en fureur, il, et il n'est pas au point en état de regarder à la fois en avant, en arrière, et de voir comment les Achaeans pouvant combattre près le neuf et en sur le salut. Il dit, et Patroc a obéi à son compagnon. De pavillon, il amenait Briseis au bel jour et la don le donnait pour le menacer. Et eux de revenir le long de la nuit des Achaeans. Contre son gré, la femme marchait avec eux. À qui lui s'est pris tout d'un coup à pleurer et, sentant écarté à ses compagnons, il s'assit sur la grève de la mer de la chanson. Les yeux sur la large vigneau, tendant les mains avec force à sa mère, il s'adressait un peu. Mère, puisque tu me fantaises pour une existence de si courte durée, restez la gloire que l'impien Zeus qui compte dans les hauteurs du ciel devait au moins me croyer. Mais non, je n'ai même pas eu de lui une faible marque d'estimée. En vérité, le tout-puissant Agamemnon, fils d'Atri, m'est tâté sans égard. Il a me pardonné, il me l'a pris, lui-même, il me l'a dérobé. Ainsi parla-t-il en versant des armes, et son auguste mère l'entendit. Elle était assise dans la profondeur de la mer, auprès de son vieux père. Vite, elle émergeait de la mer la chanson. Une brume plus tendue, elle s'assit devant Hercule et qui versa de larmes. De la main, elle caressait et dit en détachement les mots. « Mon enfant, pourquoi tu pleures-tu »« Quelle douleur est-ce venue à ton âme ?» Ne la cache pas dans ta cour. Il faut que, tu, que nous la connaissance tous les deux. Da sagte es schwer stunden zu ihr der Fuschnell Achilles. Du weißt es, was soll ich dir, die du es weißt, dies alles berichten? Wir zogen nach dem der heiligen Stadt des Sitiun, wo diese zerstörten wir und führten hierher alles. Und das verteilten unter sich gut die Söhne der Haier und wählten für den Adriesen aus die Christes Tochter, die schon wangige, und Christes wieder, der Priester des Fantreffens Apollon, kam zu den schnellen Schiffen der erzgewandten Haier, um frei zu kaufen die Tochter, und brachte unermessliche Lösung und hielt die Binden in Händen des Fantreffens Apollon an einem goldenen Stab und schlechte zu allen Haiern und den beiden Atreus Söhnen am meisten, den Ordner der Völker. Da stimmten ehrfürchtig zu alle anderen Achaia, dass man den Priester scheuen und die prangende Lösung nehmen sollte. Doch dem Atreus Sohn Agamemnon behagte das nicht im Mute, sondern er schickte ihn über fort und legte ihm ein hartes Wort auf. Und zürnend ging er der Kreis wieder hinweg und Apollon hörte auf ihn, wie er bettete, der ihm sehr lieb war. 
und er sandte auf die Agaia sein böses Geschoss, denn die Völker starren dicht getrennt und es kamen die Geschosse des Gottes überall hin im Reiten her der Haier. Uns aber, sagte der Seher, der es gut wusste, die Göttersprüche des Ferntreffers. Als bald hieß ich als erster, den Gott gnädig zu stimmen, und den Antrieben ergriff darauf der Zorn und schnell aufgestanden, drohte an das Wort, das nun verwirklicht wurde. Denn jene entsenden mit einem schnellen Schiff die hellblickenden Nahaya nach Krise und führten gar mit sich für den Herrn. Die aber, da ging M. Herold aus der Hütte und führte sie weg, die Tochter des Priesters, die mir gaben die Söhne der Haier. Doch du, wenn du es vermagst, nimm dich an deinen tapferen Sohn. Geh zum Olympus und lädt zu Zeus, wenn du denn jemals gefällig warst, mit einem Wort im Herzen des Zeus oder einem Werk. Denn oft habe ich dich in den Häusern des Vaters nicht rühmen hören, wie du sagtest, dass du dem schwarzwolkigen Kronion allein unter den Unsterblichen das schmählige Verderben abgewehrt, als ihn binden wollten die anderen Olympier, Hera und Poseidon und Pallas Athene. Aber du kamst Götten und löstest ihn von den Fesseln, da du schnell den Hunderdamm rief zum großen Olympus, den Priaros, die Götter nennen, alle Menschen aber, Agaion, der ist stärker an Kraft als sein Vater Poseidon. Und er setzte dich nieder bei Kronion und seinen Pranken vor. Und vor dem fürchteten sich die seligen Götter und banden ihn nicht. Daran erinnere ihn jetzt und setze dich zu ihm und fasse seine Knie. Ob er wohl gewillt wäre, den Treuen beizustehen, die aber an den hinteren Schiffen und am Meer zusammenzudrängen, die Ahaya hingemordet, auf das sie alle genug benommen von ihrem König. Und es erkenne auch der Treuson, der weit herrschende Agamemnon, seiner Verblendung, dass er den Besten der Haier für nichts geehrt hat. Darauf erwiderte ihn Tethys, Tränen vergießend. O oh mir, mein Kind, was habe ich dich aufgezogen zum Unheil geboren, dass du doch bei den Schiffen ohne Tränen und ohne Leid sessest, wo doch dein Lebenslos nur kurz ist und gar nicht verlange. Jetzt aber bist du zugleich kurzlebig und elend vor allem. So habe ich dich zu schlimmem Schicksal geboren in den Häusern. Doch, um dir dieses Wort im Zeus zu sagen, dem Donner freuen, gehe ich selbst zum Olympus, dem Starken beschneiden, ob er mir folge. Aber du, bleibe jetzt sitzen bei den schnell fahrenden Schiffen und zürne weiter den Achaien und halte dich ganz vom Kampfe fern. Denn Zeus ist gestern zum Okeanos unter den, die untadeligen Äthiopen gegangen zum Gasmal, denn die Götter alle gingen mit ihm. Doch am zwölften Tag wird er dir wieder zurückgehen zum Olympus. Und dann gehe ich dir als Bad zum Haus des Zeus mit der Ellenschwelle und flehe ihn an bei den Knien. Und er wird mir folgen, denke ich. Tras hablar así, se marchó y lo dejó allí mismo, irritado en su ánimo por la mujer de bello talle que por la fuerza y contra su voluntad le habían quitado. En tanto, Ulises llegó a Crisa conduciendo la sacra hecatombe. Cuando arribaron al interior del puerto de múltiples cimas, arriaron las velas y las depositaron en la negra nave. Abatieron, abatieron el mástil sobre la horquilla y arraron los cables raudamente, y a remo impulsaron el barco hasta fondear. Echaron que... Cameras anclas y ataron las amarras de popa. Saltaron ellos mismos sobre la rompiente del mar y sacaron la catombe en honor del flechador Apolo. Y salió Criseida de la nave surcadora del ponto. Luego, el muy ingenioso Aquiles la condujo hacia el altar. La puso en las manos de su padre y le dijo, Crises, Agamenón, soberano de hombres, me ha enviado a traerte a tu hija y a ofrecer a Feo Apolo una sacra catombe en favor de los dánaos para propiciarnos al soberano, que ahora ha dispensado deplorables duelos a los argivos. Tras hablar así, la puso en, la, en sus manos y él acogió alegre a su hija. Con ligereza la sacra hecatombe en honor del Dios colocaron seguidamente en torno del bien edificado altar y se lavaron las manos y cogieron los granos de cebada majada. Crisas oró en alta voz con los brazos extendidos. Óyeme tú, el del argento argo que proteges Crisa y la muy divina Sila y sobre los ténedos imperas con fuerza. Ya una vez antes escuchaste mi plegaria y me honraste. 
e infligiste un grave castigo a la hueste de los aqueos. También ahora cúmpleme este otro deseo. Aparta ya ahora de los dánaos, de los dánaos el ignobioso estrago. Así habló en su plegaria y, escuchó, y la escuchó el fuego Apolo. Tras elevar la súplica y expolvear los granos de sobada majada, primero echaron atrás las fresudas, las desollaron y las degollaron. Despesaron los muslos y los cubrieron con grasa, formando una doble capa y encima pusieron los trozos de carne cruda. El anciano los asaba, <coughs> los asaba sobre unos leños mientras rutilante vino vertía. Al lado, unos jóvenes hacían asadores de cinco puntas. Tras, consumir, tras consumirse ambos muslos el, al fuego y catar las vísceras, trincharon el resto y lo desataron en brochetas. Los asaron cuidadosamente y retiraron todo del fuego. Una vez terminada la faena y dispusieron el banquete, participaron del festín y nadie careció de equitativa porción. Después de saciar el apetito de bebida y de comida, los muchachos colmaron crateras de bebida, que repartieron entre todos tras ofrendar las primicias en copas. Todo el día estuvieron propiciando al Dios con cantos y danzas los muchachos de los aqueos, entonando un peán en el que se liberaron al protector, y este se recreaba la mente lo En sin herin donare gegrien, sandal o eche yeh hundrön, ek beren en tön yeren trae, la brin birlin hav na lüch, nere skola vatten og, a rosen fjör hursch na niel, der ek sliech nan greich en suen, skrat jesse har huen gutriel, legem fat hilgech nan je, an straun afen kutrum ur, hok yet en kraun bijere grey, Si shin ied rish real vrej en tul, la anul serves rin kul, va bru era chanavish kroin, ishem min fronag nam bark, chlinche kron en arsht mutroin. Bolua a shurs puhien, ha reinchen lia gorem den stuch, kuak avalam pusht hein, fucham kregak den arm kroin, nu ranek en jurek cheer, Harnkegi na skip kufon, skur ied mor palchen fo tuv, skul ied fjog nam bis nam long, ek tuv a chavlich fo groim, hui mak feles nan ruig krai, feleg vilchach er gol na chriev, gun aimjach er gniev avlar, gun suim er koniev nam slo, hokas en glich gumor uel, Fool is cheerhurt, skris is ar, ristorum vash na einig kroi. Nish van damne matten jeerk, a geri gudruig nuig, jov ulen jarst voor is na je, jalle von eer ek tuve goin. Nan stre solche suus kuneev, ja filiet, so heen er hus. Ach nien lege hechish fla. Feinchen a wich grei er kuhl. Wa heri gu mocht und bluei, Mar weel kurschech ton gurem hio, Ranneki jirmelch nan speer, Gu juchersht jal reelich jo. Hitsch am moor hunnige ei, Kien wo chrach an aarsch gu glor, Er mulloch olympus uur, Jalleches a geet kruachs nan jo. Sleich ische ri violev tju, ga vi glunjen ne bosch gli, hlieb i eesig le ges laev, skur asluk i grasen ri, aher geuf met jervo meem, sen jeek nevi, n beel nun gniev, larem en achim gefoel, eis le baes hoor john me veem, hoor alle de wak, Gan tuol, anrych truie, suie gyar. Siol hwt mar glach ri an hluog, a gar hwys le hanyas kyar. Chiegersche, ie glich fi voin, eri le trae bwys an stri. Hwms kuntig uram von greig, gis an trein a uor an speech. Fregrych kich toch jo, a gyar, a kwy kien na host fo groen, glas heetjes ko tjaun mo groen, spar i chus le hoor ni groen, a her groeig tjen foy, 
smurchoni hu hulch a hiev, hashpen rov irin mochrai, gur mish tara mesk nan jia, reka tria nan tuv nil tru, she gosne vo grun da grev, cum am bier angriev a drun, a huske go briegrich hur, vi juno la lastrich jerech, Svulchig orum stru garega biolf, i kasic fjug niev gebuon, mum lefarst heen rislur chroi. Vise falevs jen feichil chor, musk av juno morstig bech, lemse bie gach ni hadreer, hosch nan orstu fein gutschach. Loskun kregion ruun han chuim, naskem Le krachach machin, deinach kutremach chaun, dan tor niev go himlen suim, suim nach du kore griev, sanish nach chage flar le fjal, sin doi so chaunglem avion, doi a ver go krieg nan gal, hush imper a toren groi, so kash mach gundur mar hier. A chau nasgig nam bach traum a huv melgen chron e sier. Chiu alch curi chul vi voin, gomlusge a nuun, snau. Chorige jessach o goin, lam hechish gu grun da goin, par olimpus nam kruag snach, sinig jov gu atriv buon, gu grat as an kariv oor, roich jach mortig je, an chie, jerich arscht wein an speer, srein sluech gu ihr le fierf, hui essen ne chacherei, ach juno van arscht a freuch, jeinig a chorla chuim, schova jalev nan loem ri höv, hechisch chos aregetig chom, ingen schöner nan ton gharam. In schin, Hjönsken jún og kukér, a glór harsin vér a vorra. Kúi sút a hín an kó, rís na djellef, hún kór a kjú. Se kráhk ag sír í húdskak bjárst, mis a vín töv macht a rún. Gag lévre fórg gan djenn, snýl djíver et orum se chöi. A njákk am fisrúgt a vjákk, gan jú júno fjárst na sói. A ela deu resposta ao Pai dos homens e dos deuses. Era, não penses vir a conhecer todas as minhas palavras. Difíceis elas te seriam, minha esposa, embora sejas. Porém, aquilo que te compete ouvir, ninguém o ouvirá primeiro, pertence a ele à raça dos homens ou dos deuses. Mas sobre aquilo que eu decido pensar afastado dos deuses, não faças perguntas nem de modo algum procuro saber. A ele respondeu Era, rainha com olhos de plácida toura. Crónida terribilíssimo, que palavra foste tu dizer? No passado nunca tive o hábito de perguntar ou inquirir, mas sempre descansado pudeste planear o que bem querias. Mas sinto agora um receio terrível, que influenciado te tenha Tétis, dos pés prateados, filha do velho do mar, pois de manhã cedo se sentou contigo e te agarrou os joelhos. E a ela julgo eu que inclinaste a cabeça, em sinal de penhor em como honrarás aqueles, matando muitos junto às naus dos aqueus. A ela deu resposta a Zeus que comanda as nuvens. Deus é surpreendente, sempre coisas imaginas, nunca te escapo. Mas nada te conseguirás alcançar, e do meu coração ficarás ainda mais longe. E isso para ti será a coisa pior. Se é esse o caso, é porque assim o caso me aprove. Senta-te em silêncio e ouve as minhas palavras, com receio de que em nada te ajudem os deuses no Olimpo quando te me aproximar, para te, para te pôr as minhas mãos irresistíveis. Assim falou, androntou se a rainha com olhos de plácida toura. Sentou-se em silêncio, vergando seu amado coração. Confrangeram-se no palácio de Zeus os deuses celestiais. Entre eles tomou então a palavra o famoso artífice, Efesto, para agradar a mãe amada, era de alvos braços. Na verdade, que trabalho tão triste e insuportável se vos agredis deste modo por causa dos mortais, lançando o conflito entre os deuses. Nem há prazer no belo festim, pois prevalece o que há de pior. A minha mãe deu este conselho. Sabedor, embora seja, que agrada a Zeus, pai amado, para que de novo a não censure o pai, agitando assim o nosso banquete. E se quisesse o astral flamejador olímpio precipitar-nos dos nossos assentos? É que de longe é ele o mais forte. 
Mas fala que tu com palavras suaves, de imediato será o Olímpio compassivo para connosco. Assim falou, levantando-se uma taça de asa dupla, colocou nas mãos da minha amada e assim lhe disse. Aguenta, minha mãe, e refreia-te, apesar do que sofres, para que a ti, que tanto amo, meus olhos não vejam atingida, pois nessa altura não poderia eu socorrer-te, por muito que me doesse. Duro é o Olímpio de enfrentar. Já em tempo anterior, quando tentei salvar-te, me agarrou ele pelo pé e me lançou para fora do limiar divino. Durante um dia inteiro me despenhei, e ao pôr do sol caí em lemos. Pouco era o sopro que me restava. Foi aí, depois da minha queda, que os síntias me trataram. Assim falou, e sorriu a Deus a era de alvos braços. Sorrindo, recebeu na mão a taça do filho. Depois, da esquerda para a direita, a todos os outros deuses, ele serviu o doce néctar, tirando-o de uma cratera, e brotou entre os deuses bem-aventurados o riso inexaurível, quando viram em festa fadigando-se pelo palácio. Deste modo, durante todo o dia, até ao pôr do sol, se banquetearam, e nada lhes faltou no festim compartilhado, nem mesmo a lindíssima lira, que a pau segurava, nem o canto das musas, que cantavam um canto alternado, respondendo umas às outras com voz maravilhosa. Quando desceu a luz resplandecente do sol, cada qual foi para a sua casa descansar. Lá onde o palácio, para cada um construíra, com artes engenhosas, um muito famigerado efesto, Deus ambidesto. Para o leite foi Zeus, astral rompejador Olímpio, onde costumava dormir quando o doce sono sobrevinha. Deitou-se e adormeceu. Ao seu lado estava a era do trono dourado. That was it. I hope you enjoyed it and you are all motivated to read it again. Or maybe reread it, why not? And um, yeah, I would like to thank again Uh, Professor Crawford for being uh, here with us today and for his uh, thoughtful and uh, emotional uh, speech. Thank you very much. Of course, all the readers uh, who were very supportive uh, right from uh, the beginning. Um, yeah, and thank you all for being here and being part of uh, uh, our event. And you're all very welcome uh, to join us for lunch in the Macmillan Room. So, thank you.